God is concealing things and it is the honor of kings or whatever to search out a matter. And that's what we're doing. We're here today searching out matters. Anyway, there was a point I was going to make about this and uh, now I forgot. And I, I, I got started and we'll remember it in a minute. But, um, uh, okay, wherever we were, go ahead and start reading and I'll remember what I was going to say. All right, so take off your sandals. Oh, the pre-incarnate Christ. I already answered that. So that's what's the point. But I was showing why I believe that. Okay. It this couldn't possibly be on your wonderful one website. Probably not. No. Prob I don't know. I haven't done anything on that site in two or three years. But Thanks. Okay. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face. Because he was afraid to look at God. So he, he's, even if he, you know, I'm sure Moses already knew this based on them teaching it. But when he makes a claim that I am the God of Abraham, I have made a covenant with Abraham. Okay. And then I said to Isaac, this covenant continues through you. And then to Jacob, he changed his name to Israel. This is the people of Israel. He knew that he was dealing. This, this voice that came out of this bush already told him things that he had already been instructed in, I am sure. And so he is just, that's why he's afraid. He's, th this God existed when my great-grandfather Abraham was alive. It was a great-grandfather, yeah. And um, uh, so you can just imagine the fear that he must have had when he heard this, right? Okay, go ahead. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of the people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the, that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Prezalites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Okay, he mentioned six of them this time. Other times he'll mention seven, whatever. But these are the same names. If you remember, I said pay attention to these names a couple months ago when we were way back in the earlier parts of Genesis, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, and they gave all these genealogies. And I said, the reason why these are being given is because they're going to come up again. You will see these same names come up again. And these are the people that are going to be dispelled, okay? Um, term land flowing with milk and honey is used throughout the Bible to describe Israel. And um, there's something I'm missing about milk and honey. Uh, there's some symbolism there that I'm completely forgetting. I just went through this about six months ago. Anyway, I'll think of it. Land flowing with milk and honey. We'll come up with that again, and I'll, I'll, I'll remember to check that for you. But uh, it does have some symbolism. Go ahead. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now I go, and I am sending you to favor. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. On this mountain. And we know it was Mount Sinai that he went to, so he, he tells you right there. And um, it says, um, uh, here, this is God speaking to him. And he tells him, go ahead, you're going to do this thing. And Moses says, but who am I to do this? So you already get a sense of his failing. God is speaking to him saying, I have chosen you. I hear the affliction of my people Israel. I was there at the time of Abraham. I was, you know, in other words, he already knows everything that Moses could possibly want to ask or, or possibly question. And yet Moses says, well, who am I? It's uh, what I've thought everything else out except my decision of who is going to do this. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, did I make a mistake here? I'm talking about God. Did I make a mistake here? I've seen the oppression of my people. I made a promise to Abraham. All of these things I'm already totally in control of. Do you think that I've made some type of mistake picking you? You see, and it, uh, the answer is obviously no. And what does Moses do? He questions it anyway. So it's just showing that, you know, all of us, if Moses is this great person that the people called the deliverer even 3,500 years later, and he said these things, it shows that we're all in the same boat in some way. Lord, how can I be your servant? And yet he can find value in us if we are simply, you know, I, I don't know about any of you here if you think, well, I'm just not good enough to tell somebody about Jesus or I'm not, I, I don't know how to speak about Jesus or whatever. 
Jay, you're certainly capable. If he can use Moses, he can use you. Same, Lil, whatever. We, we, we are capable of doing it, but we have to say, I am going to trust you, Lord. You called me to be a Christian, and therefore I have value in your sight in, in the sense that I can do this thing that you want me to do, whatever it is. Okay, so please go ahead. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and, they, and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you to me. Okay, hold on there. That is, that is the standard of understanding the nature of God if no other verse in the Bible does it. I am who I am. And if you were here at the very beginning when we went through Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and we spent three hours on it, I probably spent 30 minutes on this one name right here. I am. There is no change in God. Now, some of you have the NIV, and it is footnoted. Read the footnote. Mom, you've got the NIV there. What does footnote say? 314. Yahweh is delivered from the Hebrew. Not the commentary, the footnote. Read the footnote. Footnote. Oh, I will be what I will be. Okay. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, I am who I am. Okay. He will not be what he will be. Right. He is who he is. It is possible to. Yes, it is possible to translate that. And the, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, I believe, use that. But we have to be careful that God is. He doesn't change. There's no change in him. And then what does it say? It's, in, um, it's somewhere, I believe, in John 8, where he says, um, uh, 858. Yes, he quotes this particular verse. He says, then the Jews said to him, you are not 50 years old, and yet you have seen Abraham, Jesus. And here he goes once again. This is another indication of why I can believe what I... Lil, are you leaving us? I know you do. Have a wonderful evening. Bless you. Bless you, Lil. Okay. Jesus is saying, before Abraham was, I am. Okay? He is who he is. There's no change in God. I honestly believe that however this works, he is... He's saying, I was right there at the beginning. Okay. Here he goes... Um, Jesus said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Okay, then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Okay, now, has anybody ever heard that the, the uh, Greek in there is so emphatic that Jesus was proclaiming himself God? Have you heard that in a sermon? I've heard it several times where there's no doubt the people knew that he was stating that he was God because of the Greek term. And they will tell you, the Greek is this, I just want you to understand this, the Greek for I am there is translated ego imi. I might have, might have two e's there. Ego imi, okay? It's saying I am. It's emphatic. And they're saying that this Greek here is saying that he is claiming to be Yahweh. Some of your Bibles will have that capitalized. Some of them won't, okay? What I would like you to do is I'd like you to go to um, the next chapter, chapter 9, and let's see here, where is it? What book are you in? I, John, 9, and read verse 9. I, well, I start with 8 so everybody knows what you're reading. John 9, verse 8 and 9. His neighbors and those who had... Oh. Yeah, that's right. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. I am the man. Guess what word he uses? Ego e me. Is that guy claiming to be God? No. He's saying, it's me. It's really me. Okay? He's using this term. So we cannot use, if you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness or anybody else and say, Jesus was claiming deity because of the term ego e me. And you go online and you'll see all kinds of commentaries that say this and you'll hear it in sermons. You'll hear it all the time. That is not what he was doing. What he was doing when he claimed deity was saying that before Abraham was, it's really me. Okay, this doesn't prove deity. And if you try to use these two words to prove deity, all they need to do is turn one more 
uh, page and they'll say, well, this guy must be deity then. He's using the exact same term. The construct of the sentence is what proves deity. Context. Context. That's right. The construct of that sentence before Abraham was, it was really me. Okay? And how do we know that they believed that he was claiming to be God? How do we know? Go back and read the account again. One chapter before, 58 and 59. Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, and I'll let you read 59. Before Abraham was, ego imi. He's saying emphatically, I am before Abraham was. It's not the words, so don't let anybody tell you that the words do it. Because if you do, then you've made an error. The construct does. Okay, but what's the next sentence say? Then, uh, 59. 59. John 8. Okay, it says here, Then they took up stones to throw at him. That tells you that they knew absolutely he was claiming to be God. There is the proof that you need. He is claiming deity, which is blasphemy. Okay? So do you see how that works? That's what's going on. Don't let people sidetrack you with their deep knowledge of Greek and then come to find out that what they've said is not correct. The construct of the sentence and the reaction of the people tells you that he was claiming to be God and that they were uh, angry about that. Okay? That is what is going on there. And one more point about that. Um, when he spoke to them, you guys got to go? Yeah. All right. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. All right. Take care. Um, uh, the one other point about that, and I just forgot, and I, I'm going to have to look at it one more time because they were walking out. Um, uh, uh, they, before Abraham was, they, um, they took up stones to throw it. Now, I've just completely lost what I was going to say. Something happened. They must have a, a family crisis or something because they yeah, phone did. rang and, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I feel yeah. bad. We'll say, remind me to say a prayer for him before we leave. Um, uh, Jews said to him, you're not 50 years old and you have seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. Oh, that's what I was going to say. When he was speaking to them, what language was he speaking to them in? Aramaic. Aramaic or possibly Hebrew. Most likely Aramaic was the lingua franca. Okay, Hebrew was used in the synagogues and it was as it is to this day. But the, the language of the area at the time was Aramaic. And so when he spoke to them, he would have probably used the term, I am. Right? Do you see what I'm saying? But in Greek, all I'm trying to tell you is to be careful about the Greek and how people say, well, this is, he was claiming to be God, but this ego in me proves that he was claiming to be God. It says it elsewhere in the New Testament, and he, the guy is certainly not pr pr yeah. claiming to be God. So be very careful that when you hear something, don't run with it. Because I used to. I'd heard that somebody say it, and he was so adamant that he must be right, and then I went and ran with it. And then later I was reading the, the Bible in Greek, and I came to the guy, and it says ego in me, and I thought, what? You know, he's, so there you go. That's enough of that. But I am who I am. I am the unchanging God. I existed before creation. I'm the one that spoke the world into existence. Do you have that Bible that you had in the car with you? Did you bring that in, the RSV? She saw something today. You know, I've never read the RSV, but we might as well because we're talking about... Would you go get that? Nah, don't worry about it. I'll just tell them what it says. What? Our footnote says, I am because I am. Yes. There, that's it. That's all there is to it. I am because I am. In other words, I cannot not be. I know that sounds like a, 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 a double speak, but it's not. You listen to R.C. Sproul's tape of the month this month, and it's very good. It speaks about this type of issue, and he does a very good job of it. But he, he simply cannot not exist. He is eternally existent. He, is, he didn't become. He just is. All right. She, when she was, um, we were driving over here, she was reading, we, I always keep a Bible in our cars just in case I go somewhere. I, I put it down where I'm eating lunch or whatever, just so people might have a question. But the one that is in there is an RSV, Revised Standard Version, actually New Revised Standard Version. But um, the creation account, I got to tell you, this is why I keep telling you, read different versions. <laughs> because you get different things out of them. And I'd never really read that, and if I had it, it went right over my head, and she picked up on it immediately. The RSV focuses on the creation and not on God. It, it is a, a very poor, now that I see it, a very poor translation of Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 3. It says, uh, when God, in the beginning, when God, um, 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, I think. It adds that in. It's focusing on the creation, not on God. 